Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this first session of Net Zero Skills, um, brought to you by Cambridge Carbon Footprint uh, with support from Cambridge City Council. So today, as I said, is uh, our first session um, focusing on understanding climate action, what that means. Um, I'm going to give you a big, quick intro of what that means in a, in a second. So um, the first of four sessions and the next ones um, will be all around getting you started with your climate action in your local community, um, working with others and communicating climate change. Sorry, Annie. Yep. I'm afraid we're not seeing the images on your slides where... Mm, yeah, okay. there we go. Okay, so it might just take a moment to load when I click through the slides. So the agenda for today is just a quick welcome and some introductions and then I'm going to talk to you about uh, what does net zero carbon mean and then I'm handing over to Anna from CamCycle to talk to us about climate action on all levels and then we'll have some time for questions after that. Uh, and after a short break we're going to have a bit of a discussion around um, climate action in practice and um, and then another round of conversation in, in a bigger group and um, and some next steps after that. So I'm handing over to my colleague Alana to do a, uh, a round of introductions. Maybe you can introduce yourself first, Danny. <laughs> so I'm I'm Annie. Uh, I'm the project manager for uh, for Net Zero Skills, and I was involved in delivering the um, Net Zero Now um, training last year, um, which was um, delivered in South Camps uh, district, uh, in the district of South Camps. Um, and so I will introduce myself. So my name's Alana and I am the manager at Cambridge Carbon Footprint. Um, so I worked with Annie, um, mostly supporting her in delivering the Net Zero Now um, training that we ran last year. Uh, but I have my fingers in most of CCS pies. Um, in, in all of the work that we do. So I'll actually give you a bit of an introduction to, to CCF as well. Um, so we are a tiny climate change charity. Um, so we are just two and a half full-time equivalent staff basically, um, but we have hundreds of different volunteers. Um, and over the course of a year, we would typically run about maybe 50 different events and activities, um, all supporting carbon reduction and climate leadership. Um, so some projects that we run that you might have heard of would be open eco homes. We open up homes that are um, either retrofitted or um, built new to be energy efficient and sustainable. And we have case studies that, that people can um, come to grips with the, the changes that have been made and find out how they can make them to their own home. And um, we've also been um, quite influential in supporting repair cafes to grow in our region. So um, we now have something like 26 different repair cafes in our region. Um, which we've we've helped to grow from just two back in 2016. Um, and most recently we have launched the Cambridge Climate Change Charter um, on behalf of the City Council. Um, and so now you can jump on our resource uh, on our website, access all sorts of resources, a carbon footprint calculator, um, and you can you know join with others in in um, Cambridge in sort of pledging your net zero ambition. Um, so our events are always informative, fun and practical. You know, we really aim to inspire people, but also to give them the practical tools um, to, to move towards um, that net zero goal, which, which Annie will, I guess, be exploring a little bit more today. Cool. Thank you. So, yeah. Uh, so we won't go into too much detail on climate science and everything, but I just wanted to give you a quick reminder of what we mean when we're talking about net zero and, and climate action. So our goal is to mitigate climate change and all its catastrophic con consequences. So, so why does, um, plan so just a quick reminder of why climate change happens. You can imagine our atmosphere like a kind of blanket around our planet and it keeps us nice and warm. So similar to a greenhouse, hence the name greenhouse effect. 
Um, however, at the moment, we are adding more and more density to this you know, blanket that keeps us nice and warm, and it's making it too thick for comfort. So the gases in the atmosphere that trap heat are called um, greenhouse gases. And there are a wide range of different greenhouse gases. The most commonly discussed ones are carbon dioxide and methane. And they all have different characteristics. And for example, carbon does not trap as much heat as methane, but it stays in the atmosphere for longer. And methane um, is, um, is and, and carbon is much harder to remove than, than carbon. But then methane, for example, traps much more, car uh, much more heat, so it's more potent, um, but it's easier to remove. So um, the gases, sorry, and, and all of these gases are then also produced by different parts of our um, activity. So for example, methane is more produced by agriculture, um, more produced by um, animal activities and so on, whilst carbon dioxide is mainly produced by um, fire, um, burning fossil fuels. So in order to you know, make it easier for us to talk about this and quantify these things and, and compare the, the impact of different activities. We often simply refer to carbon when we talk about climate um, greenhouse gases. So when we speak about carbon and net zero, this is really what we're, what we're talking about as, as um, all of these different greenhouse gases, but just um, simplified as, as carbon. So the more carbon, the more greenhouse gases we add to the atmosphere, the hotter our, cl our climate gets. So scientists can calculate how much our climate is going to warm depending on the concentration of greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. Um, so this way we can generate estimates like these that you've probably seen, um, how much our atmosphere um, heats up over the next couple of years. If we want to stay within the two degree um, limit of heating, which we do want, um, we um, should, we need to reduce the car, uh, the, sorry, if we want to stay within a two degree um, um, warning, warming, um, we need to put more attention onto how much carbon we put, how much greenhouse gases we produce and um, emit into our atmosphere. And this is what we then call the CO2 budgets. So it basically breaks down how much CO2 we are allowed to spend to produce and emit into our atmosphere um, without reaching you know, and, and surpassing a certain tipping point. That means we need to reach a point uh, somewhere in the near future where our um, carbon emissions fall below um, the, uh, what the amount of carbon that is um, extracted from the atmosphere. And this point where our um, emissions fall beneath what is um, taken out of the atmosphere, that is what we call the net zero, the, um, where emissions equal what is extracted. As with any accounting, there are two sides to this equation, the amount of how much greenhouse gas we generate and um, the amount of how much is being extracted from the atmosphere, meaning the carbon sinks. So you might have heard that term before. At the moment, our spend, so how much we actually produce, far outweighs um, our credit, so how much we can extract from the atmosphere. That's where climate action comes in. So we're trying to reach this balance. We're trying to reach net zero. So how much, um, so how are we doing in this race for net zero? Our region is actually lagging behind the UK average. In Cambridge and Peterborough Combined Authority, um, emissions are approximately a, a quarter, so 25% higher per person than the UK average. So this is mainly due to cars and lorries and, uh, and transport in general. But not only are we are our emissions higher, but our progress to, so our race to, to net zero is also slower than the UK average. 
Um, at the same time, our region is especially sensitive to the effects of climate change. So regional temperatures are rapidly increasing and um, we are also um, quite low, so we are more vulnerable to, to sea level rises. At our current level of emissions, we here in our area um, have only six years really um, before we have exhausted our allowance um, in, in emitting climate, uh, um, CO2 climate gases. So how much are we spending at the moment? Well, about four times as much as a person living in China, roughly. So that if you see that international comparison, you can see that UK is definitely up there with the big ones. And then um, you can see that people in, in different parts of the world are emitting far, far less. And then what do we spend our, our CO2 emissions on? Um, roughly speaking, food, home energy, um, transport and shopping. But then there's also emissions created by just living in the UK. So by having access to heated swimming pools and libraries, by having a government, by, by having access to government buildings, a police force, fire engines, military. So all of these things that um, are provided to us in the UK create a sort of um, national overhead of climate emissions. So for us as an individual and in our communities, what does, does reaching net zero mean? When we talk about climate action on a local level, we like to focus on the four areas of our personal carbon emissions that we as individuals can, can influence. So that is the food we consume, the energy we use to heat our homes, um, the transport, uh, the emissions that we create by, by transporting ourselves, um, around and um, by, by the shopping that we do. So that is non-food shopping like clothes and, and gadgets and that sort of thing. And then on the other side, um, there are the climate, uh, the carbon sinks. So things like um, trees, oceans and healthy soils that ex extract carbon from the atmosphere. Climate action can also mean, can so, so that means that climate action can also mean growing more trees, improving soil quality, and um, thus creating new or improving these carbon sinks. Are there any questions so far? So you're very welcome to unmute yourselves and um, ask any questions you've got so far. No? Okay, then I'll, I'll hand over to, to Anna to talk a bit more about um, climate action on all levels. Uh, I'll stop sharing and Anna will share her slides. You just need to unmute yourself before you start. Sorry, is that better? <laughs> Hello everybody. Um, so I'm Anna Williams. Um, I have kind of been interested in environmental issues since I was kind of a 10 year old with a Blue Peter Green book. Um, uh, and currently I work for CamCycle, the Cambridge Cycling Campaign. Um, and we're a, a local charity uh, working for more, better and safer cycling um, for all ages and abilities in around Cambridge. Um, and we do this in a variety of ways through sort of campaigning and producing resources, hosting events. Um, one of the things that um, we're quite well known for, if you live in Cambridge, you might have heard of the Chisholm Trail. Um, so this is a new walking and cycling route that just opened, the first part opened at the end of last year. Um, and we've also just, um, published a new uh, campaign uh, promoting and celebrating cargo bikes. Um, so this is a picture of me with a load of uh, people riding wonderful cargo bikes um, across the bridge, which is part of the Chisholm Trail. And one of the things that I really uh, find rewarding about my role is um, helping other people take action. Um, and so last year, um, 
our camp cycle member survey, 91% um, of people said they'd responded to a consultation with our help, um, which is really brilliant to see. And I can also see that, um, you know, together, like the amazing difference we can have together, I, I see the changes that have then on decision making and then ultimately on the ground, um, sort of building new cycleways, um, getting more people cycling. Um, so that's, yeah, it's brilliant. So today I'm going to talk a bit about climate action on all levels. We're going to look at the sort of five areas that Annie highlighted, uh, food, travel, stuff, energy and sinks, um, and some different levels. Um, but also going to just talk a bit about kind of just getting ready to take action and just some of the things we need to think about like and, and just really why to take action as well. Um, so I'll just look at uh, individual action versus influencing change, reviewing values and stories, um, some tools for the journey, um, what we need to do and then look at the different levels and then I just touch a little bit on um, what's happening locally um, sort of in local democracy and different ways you can get involved there. So to start with um, you often see kind of online um, this sort of discussion about where should we place our focus, should we be doing individual action or should we be influencing change um, and so I thought um, there's a good chart here on the left um, from um, a really a book I'd really recommend about carbon footprints and how bad are bananas and it really looks at kind of the carbon footprint of different everyday activities um, and so the author in his update to this book which came out um, in last year I think or 2020 um, he came up with this Venn diagram that sort of shows the balance that he recommends um, between cutting your own carbon and then pushing for change kind of more widely in society. Um, and you might be somebody you're thinking actually, oh, I'm really more comfortable just cutting my own individual footprint. Um, but I think this, this quote here from um, Amri Bono, the zero waste chef, really just shows that actually, you know, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste or doing net zero perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. So the more people we can um, kind of encourage just to cut their footprint a bit, if we can encourage, you know, 10, 20, 100 people, that's actually going to have much more impact than if we kind of spend a lot of time trying to be perfect ourselves, which we'll, <laughs> we'll never achieve. Um, you know, so, so really like trying to speak out about the um, the issues and kind of about steps you're taking is really important as well. Um, but then on the other hand as well, you might have people that are thinking, oh, I'm more, I'm more comfortable in the kind of pushing for change area. Why should I, you know, um, oh, it's harder. There might be more barriers to cutting your own carbon or you feel there might be some people there, they feel they've gone as far as they can go. Um, and, and this Greta Thunberg um, quote really says, kind of explains why why it's important to have individual action as well. Um, so by stopping flying, you not only reduce your own carbon footprint, but also that sends a signal to other people around you that the climate crisis is a real thing. Um, and I th I've just put another few points about why I think individual action is important here. Um, so firstly, it does make a difference. Um, as Annie said, um, there's this kind of blanket around us um, and every, it, you know, it's it, it, the, really, the climate so tackling taking climate action is actually about physics um so every gram every kilogram every ton that we add to this sort of blanket in our atmosphere um then we're kind of setting up the type of future that we that we that our children and and sort of yeah that, that is going to be kind of affecting us so so every sort of tiny bit we can save will does make a difference um, and secondly, um, taking individual action helps persuade others. So people, um, if you walk the talk, that's a very effective way of encouraging others to take action. Um, just like sort of children model their behaviour on adults, we still sort of have that really. Um, we're still very influenced by others. So if we can kind of um, go on our own journey as well as speaking out about that, it's really effective. Um, thirdly, it sort of helps build understanding of the changes needed and the barriers to achieving them. Um, so, for example, as um, somebody, I, I live without a car and that's given me great insight into, you know, the kind of problems with cycle lanes, problems with bus services. And then that can kind of help my campaigning for change within transport. Um, and then fourthly, um, sort of practical transitions in our own life supports the internal transitions that we're going to need. Um, so it's not just about the changes we need to make kind of in a practical way. Actually, um, 
there are kind of deeper changes to kind of how we live and some of the values and stories that we have in our communities. Um, and this was brought up in the IPCC report um, that's just come out this week. So one of the accompanying documents, it sort of says, targeting a climate resilient, sustainable world involves fundamental changes to how society functions, including changes to underlying values, worldviews, ideologies, social structures, political and economic systems and power relationships. This may feel overwhelming at first, but the world is changing anyway. Climate resilient development offers us ways to drive change to improve well-being for all. So really like thinking that some of the things that we do for climate will actually have benefits across loads of aspects of our life and, and that's making these kind of deep changes will actually bring deep benefits um, sort of individually and as a society. So just to talk a little bit more about that, um, just got a bit here about reviewing the values and stories and, and, and sort of by taking a bit of time to kind of do this um, internal work, this will help us in um, taking action sort of practical action as well so maybe um like sometimes you'll hear people say oh it's just like only people on the left wing of politics that care about the climate crisis that's absolutely not true you know everybody it affects everybody and it kind of affects um everybody's sort of way of looking at the world um but we just really got to tap into the values each person has within them and they will all be slightly different i've given like a few um examples here but we need to kind of really look at what's important to us and, and how we can kind of um use those values to shape the action that we then go on to take um, as we move towards net zero um, and also looking at some of the narratives and stories that we might have in our life that might be barriers or that might we might need to look at reframing rethinking um sort of Again, I've given um, a few things, a few examples here on the right. Um, and the one at the bottom is an example from my life. Um, so, for example, I grew up um, in a family where we had a lovely roast dinner every Sunday. That was a really important part of our family life. Uh, and it kind of felt difficult to, you know, that's not part of my um, family now you know and and it kind of felt like oh you know am i letting down kind of generations of my family by breaking that chain um by not sort of not eating meat and, and not doing that um but actually you know we still eating together as a family is still really important um and and sort of recognizing that i've taken that part of it um but you know we don't eat meat we don't eat quite in the same way on a sunday it's like you know looking at those stories that might be in our life where in order to live a low carbon life, we have to slightly kind of rework them, take a take a kind of nugget of something that's really important to us and then slightly rework it um, to carry on um, sort of and, and, and leave a new and new traditions for future generations. So now um, just a few more things to think about before we get started on the action and thinking about our journey. Um, a few things that are really helpful. Um, on our way um so firstly enthusiasm and it's great to see you here that's part of it you know you kind of keen to take action um so, so that's the first thing you need um secondly a bit of a place to start um so it's a bit like the first of january where you have a big list of resolutions and you want to do everything um but you know that's kind of you're more likely to kind of crash and burn if you're trying to do lots of things at once so kind of think about where where you might want to start just doing one one of two things at a time um, and, and kind of then building up the changes um, as you go um, thirdly think about your why so sometimes you know you will you'll meet kind of challenges along the way you'll meet people that challenge you and various difficulties and if you've got a kind of why um, at the heart of why you're doing it that that can really kind of help you carry on um, so maybe it's for your children and grandchildren um, maybe it's because you're concerned about people in the global south who are already experiencing um, climate related famines and and, and real problems um, maybe it's because you've got a real love of nature whatever your why is that will kind of really help you fuel you to carry on um, making changes in your life um, fourthly some people other people to support you so maybe groups like this maybe um, a little support network around you in real life or online um, and then lastly some food to fuel you so things to nourish you and this is different from everybody um, some people might be, it might be the latest scientific reports, some people it might be time in nature, 
or some inspiring kind of videos on TikTok. Um, so whatever kind of fuels you to keep on going, um, just make sure you have an idea of that, that you can kind of then give you motivation to keep on going. Um, and a few things as well um, I've got here that you don't need, you know, you, you drop um, perfectionism, being self-righteous, sort of any shame or judgment of yourself or others, because those are the type of things um, that don't really help behaviour change that are kind of will become a barrier um, from moving on positively. Okay, so now you're kind of yeah ready to make some changes um, to, to help us all together get to net zero. So you're thinking, you know, let's swap the car for an electric vehicle um, and uh, redo the kitchen. So it's all kind of this perfect zero waste cupboard. Um, and I say, no, 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 let's just like slow down. So if we um, go and look at some sort of charts and you might have heard of the five R's, um, refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. And I've got another one here for transport, which is avoid, shift, improve. And we very much need to start at the top here, looking at the refusing, reducing, avoiding, and where we can kind of cut our cloth um, to fit within the carbon budget um, that we have individually and, and as a region, um, before then moving down to other things that we can swap and change and reuse and, and um, sort of technology as well but that's like way down below um, the kind of basically simplifying our life, um, buying less, um, traveling more locally um, and one thing that I've, I've kind of been thinking and writing about this recently and I've actually found this uh, sort of alternative model of kind of change speak support has been really useful to me in thinking about um, changing things in my own life, speaking out and speaking out is really really important, talking about it is really important um, and then just also supporting um, local groups who are already working for change. And that's something that you can do as well if you feel like in your own life you haven't got loads of capacity at the moment, but you know, maybe you can become a member of uh, another local group or sort of support them through your volunteer time or money. Um, that's another um, way we can kind of have together move towards um, action. So I'm just going to use now the, the change speak support thing just to look at some of these different levels um, and, and the different areas of change and just give a few examples. So first of all stuff on an individual level, um, so an example might be you buy a second hand outfit for a party, so you start off with a real kind of like one-off event just to kind of you know go to a charity shop or something um, and then once you're at the party, speak about it, talk about it, what, uh, where your outfit came from, why you chose not to buy new. Um, and then um, support, so that, an idea for that be Cambridge Carbon Footprint, attend one of their clothes swap events. Um, and I think there's one coming up in Arbury quite soon. Um, so a sort of swishing event where you, you take some clothes and you kind of um, come back with some new ones that somebody else has brought. Um, and this one is the carbon sinks. So this is a picture of me planting trees in Wanderbury um, earlier this year. Um, so that's something you could do within your own life, volunteer to help plant trees. Um, speak out using your networks um, to call for change. And I've got a picture here um, from a local journalist who's really raising concern about a lot of mature trees that were cut down, um, which shouldn't have been um, near a, a major development because we really need to you know, preserve the mature trees we've got already as well, the, the number of years that it's taken to grow. Um, so we really need, need to be preserving as many trees as well as planting new ones. Um, and thirdly, support, um, join a local group such as Friends of Logan's Meadows. So that's a group in the north of Cambridge, um, just near the River Cam, and they're working to expand that nature reserve, plant more trees, increase biodiversity. Um, then we have food and looking at some ideas for a corporate level. Um, so maybe go meet free at some corporate events such as a training day or a conference. Um, then talk about that. So talk about that in your annual report online um, and also encourage action from your clients and suppliers as well as taking action within your business or organisation. Um, and then from the, at the support level, um, an idea could be get to give a corporate donation to a group working for change such as uh, Cambridge Sustainable Food. Then we have energy at a national level. 
Um, so for example, changing your own life could be switching to a green energy supplier, such as ecotricity and green en or green energy. Um, speaking up about energy could be writing to your MP and asking them to champion community energy schemes. So those are sort of schemes where, you know, a whole village might have uh, heat pumps that supply the whole village and, and get the village off oil. Um, there's one in Swaffham Prior, I think it is at the moment, um, that's getting going. Um, and then support, um, look at kind of national organisations such as Insulate Britain, you might want to sign the petition um, or even get involved in some of their direct action. And then finally, um, this one is travel at an international level. Um, so a change in your own life is reducing or ideally avoiding flying for both work or leisure, um, really utilising um, kind of Zoom and online conferencing more um, and travelling by train maybe to visit family or to go on holiday. Um, then speak, uh, share ideas from other countries and really kind of, yeah, again, in your networks or, um, I mean, within my role, I'm really inspired by Paris. So um, at CamCycle, we'd be raising this in questions to local decision makers, you know, like, you know, what, yeah, why can't we, why can't we live in a city that's like Paris, that's greening everything up, um, really radically improving cycling um, and, and making more livable kind of 15 minute communities. And then support um, where you can um, forge links with groups from around the world. Um, see what campaigners are doing in other countries. Um, so for example, at COP26 last year in Glasgow, um, CamCycle and two other local campaigners, Milton Cycling Campaign and Ely, we um, all signed a, a letter to governments at COP26 calling for world leaders to commit to boosting cycling levels um, to reduce carbon emissions and, and reach global uh, climate goals. And the really nice thing of that, about that, so that was 350 cycling organisations from around the world and we did succeed in kind of getting um, an extra line put in the sort of declarations. Um, but it felt really good to join with those international groups um, to achieve that. Just a little bit about um, what's happening locally and I've um, spoken about this before um, via Cambridge Carbon Footprint and so I've just put a little kind of tiny URL link there um, at the bottom left to go at and see if you want to kind of if you're interested in kind of like how our local democracy works go and check that out um, but just to sort of give a very brief overview I mean generally we have a central government at the top um, and the county council um, district council below that which also includes Cambridge city council as the sort of district level um, and then parish councils below that and in Cambridge city itself we don't really have parish councils but um, around us so south in South Cambridgeshire um, there's parish councils at kind of village village level. Um, Cambridgeshire is kind of more tricky because we then also as you can see from this kind of complicated diagram on the right from Smarter Cambridge Transport um, we also have the GCP or the Greater Cambridge Partnership and then we also have um, the mayoral combined authority, the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough combined authority. So they all also have kind of decision making powers and doing various other things. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated um, in our area. But, yeah, go and check out the other video um, for more details on that. Um, and then this is just some of the kind of plans that our local authorities have at the moment. Um, so the one on the left, this is the this is a mayoral level. The they the combined authority commissioned um, an independent uh, commission on climate to look at what we needed to do in our region. So this is their report, uh, which was published last October, um, and the combined authority have signed up to um, the recommendations in that report, um, which cover kind of yeah of, of every every level transport energy. Um, kind of also sinks because we've got a lot of peat in our region um, so kind of protecting um, the kind of carbon that's embedded in the peat things like that um, and the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Climate Action Coalition that's a kind of group of local organisations and community groups that have sort of banded together and they really want to kind of hold the combined authorities to account on, on this so um, really trying to make sure that they they do stand by their promises and they do take us on that journey to net zero. Then we have the city council climate change strategy and the county council one which is 
I think was just published last month. That's so very recent. I haven't had a chance to fully go through that, um, but take a look at, at what's in those documents. Um, Cambridge Resilience Web is um, a good website for looking at, at it, has, it features lots of different community organisations and charities um, working for action on climate and also social justice. Um, so that's a really good website to check out and then link you to other organisations you might be interested in. And then finally, um, CampCycle ourselves, we have um, a campaign at the moment called Zero Carbon Streets and we're trying to empower um, lots of local groups to take action in their communities and work for walking and cycling and also kind of banding together, having a stronger voice um, at, in front of decision makers. Um, again, just so we can increase our impact. Um, so that's the um, web link there. Do go and check that out and, and help support our campaign or get in touch if you're a member of a local group working for active travel and you, you want to get involved. And just um, finally, I've got a couple of quotes from climate scientists just to kind of reassure you that everything you do, your individual action is really important. Um, sort of thank you for getting started on this journey. Um, so the first one, Peter Kalmus, um, there's this silly debate about individual versus collective action. The only thing we have is the stream of choices we make every day and all of those choices influence other people. And then Catherine Hayhoe as well. Um, so whatever is at the top of your priority list is already being affected by climate change today. The reality is anything we do makes a difference, anything. Every bit of warming matters. And because of that, every choice matters and every action matters. Thank you. And do let me know if you've got any questions or any questions for some of the things that Annie said earlier. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, it's been really interesting. Thank you very much, both uh, of you. Um, question to Annie. Uh, you mentioned that our region was lagging behind other parts of the UK um, and suggest that was largely due to travel emissions. Um, could you just expand on that a little bit about why that is the case? Um, Yes, so what that is, sorry, let me find um, the quote. So it is um, from University of Leeds have, have been looking at different um, emissions around the country. And when they looked at Cambridge and Peterborough, the, the joint authority, they um, found that um, in our area, that is um, the lorry and car travel is particularly high. Um, there is a source, I don't have it in my notes, let me, let me try to find it and I can ping it into, uh, but I do have a link to that report and that gives you a bit more background um, info. Alana, do you want to add anything more on this? I know that you've been talking about this a bit more. Or Anna, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, so the report near the end um, I had from the Combined Authority the, or the Independent Commission on Climate, that has some more detail about that. Um, and I think partly, I mean, we have some quite rural regions where public transport is quite terrible, like sort of in Finland and Huntingdonshire, some of those areas. But also, actually, we're quite a rich region, so car ownership is quite high, uh, car use and ownership is very high. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think just generally compared to other areas of the UK, um, individual transport use is quite high um, in, in our region. Interesting, thanks. Any other questions? Just can I um, just wanted to add, um, I'm actually from uh, Fenlon District Council. So the points that you were just saying about their travel, uh, you know, really do, um, we really do have a problem in, in the area just because of the, the rurality, how rural we are and you know just just getting from a to b can be um a massive headache sometimes if you haven't got a car it would be practically impossible if you were in one of the villages i think to get to um to to towns or wherever to do to do your shopping or wherever you want to go but um i think the combined authority are working on um some kind of uh demand-led 
public transport service so that would be something that would be interested in looking at I think in Fen and I think that's potentially that could could work quite well for us in the future yeah and actually there's um, a new active travel strategy or sort of draft one that's just the papers came out this week um, and the county council will be looking at it next week um, and that was sort of interesting as well because I think it said that Finland have had a recent consultation about active travel I know and it sort of said it wasn't that people didn't have bikes for example but they did they didn't use them and I think one of the main reasons they don't use them is because yeah there, there isn't that safe cycling and walking network um, really so I think yeah hopefully there'll be sort of more focus on on rural routes and, and getting some better facilities put in as well as public transport as well. Yeah, I can, I can, um, uh, on a personal level, I've, I've sort of, you know, biked through town and been knocked by car, you know, wing mirrors from cars on bike handles and, and all that sort of thing. So we do have some cycling routes, but, um, yeah, could definitely be improved. But we've got a, um, we've got a, a walking, cycling and mobility scooter, I think, strategy or something like that that's, that's recently come out or is, is coming out. So hopefully that will try and address some of these issues as well. And, um, as uh, as she was saying, you know, this could also affect um, the health and well-being of people as well. So we do have um, some health issues and health inequality issues in the area. So um, getting more people walking, getting more people on the bikes would also help with that. So that's something that I'd like to see happen as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find that very interesting because um, when I watched the, the film 2040, I think um, that's where um, the most um, thing that sticks with me is that with the cars and, and uh, I'm very much for bikes and everything. And, and now it's all about the electric electric cars, switching to electric cars. And I, th there they, they switch. Why, uh, why do we need to have like... Um, uh, yeah, this. Um, why does everyone need a car anyway? So if you if you need to buy a new car, is it is it really? Do you need to buy a car, or do we as a as a society need to move away from that? Everyone needs to have a car, right? We need to move away to another form of of transport. Is that? Um, if I find that really interesting, uh, what you said from the Finland District Council, um, that are there are there any schemes that that like help promote this? That we not only build like charging possibilities for electric cars, so everyone, everyone goes out and about and now buys electric cars. We need to move away, right, from this, yeah, uh, this type of transport, right? But also, I think like there's something about sometimes the people that make the decisions aren't, you know, like actually within um, Finland, I think it's something like 20% of people don't drive or have access to a car and you know so they're really disadvantaged like you said it's like really hard if you don't have access to a car to kind of get around get to the shops get to your yeah. job yeah and, and there needs to be something done about that right yeah and, and yeah. then that will unlock yeah providing kind of better facilities which will help us decarbonize will unlock so many other benefits um you know yeah health and and inequality and in fact again in the independent Independent Commission for Climate Report. There's like a whole section on a just transition. How can we okay. do it in a just way? So that's really worth okay. checking out as well. Yeah, cool. I think that that draws out a, a sort of like I guess one of the the kind of key messages that we had when we were thinking about this session, about this kind of concept around action on all levels. That you know, sort of enabling people to cycle. Um, you know, or, or to, to, to get from A to B, let's put it as simple as that, you know, to get from A to B sustainably, you know, there are the choices that the individual makes, but obviously that is affected by, you know, the decisions that are undertaken by, you know, the kind of local councils and by, um, you know, by national government. And also, you know, if you're thinking about kind of transport, maybe there are kind of private companies and businesses involved that you've kind of got all of these interlocking parts that, that you know, we can... Um, as individuals take action if we're involved in those systems or that we can also try and influence and you know that there are decisions that we can make in our everyday lives so you know I think that that example kind of draws out that that kind of concept that we 
were thinking about when we were planning that session that you know there are the kind of all of these interlocking parts that we can can try and influence and move um i've got a question for you anna so you were saying earlier about um tools for your journey and one of them was was the why and um i was just wondering from your campaigning work have you found any of the why is particularly useful and particularly inspiring for for people to help them along their journey oh that's a good question i think i think within transport um one thing that really helps to think thinking about children and kind of again about fairness but you know that's another thing that kind of we could unlock that actually in other countries um so for example the netherlands where they do have a strong cycling culture children have a great amount of independence you know they cycle to school from quite a young age um, and then their parents mm. don't have to drop them everywhere you know they cycle to their friend's house and things um, so I think kind of looking at yeah sort of the benefits that we have not for children um, and also it's been quite hard few I don't know like last few months there's been quite a few people killed um, on our roads cycling and walking and, and I find I find that Kind of a very yeah that's I'm quite angry about that really that that really makes me want to take action I mean I got into the cycling from um kind of because it was convenient for me and because I cared about the environment but actually um the campaigning side yeah a kind of sense of we need safe roads so that people don't get killed just going about their everyday journeys you know like that that really drives me on in, in terms of campaigning Yeah, I can, I can imagine. Joe, did you want to add anything? I was just looking at my notes actually, because there was something that I, uh, came up earlier. I think, um, Annie, it was when you were, you were doing your presentation, you said, um, you mentioned something about only having um, six years until we've, um, mm. sorry, I didn't quite get that, what you were talking about there. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Um, so it is basically coming back to that idea of having a, a budget. So um, I guess it's it's um, so so my my idea that I um, explained earlier around about thinking thinking about the atmosphere as 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 a blanket, and when we get to a certain density, and we're basically adding downs every every day with everything we do, and you at some point we're going to get to a, a, a density of that blanket that or do they let's let's say do they because you know it uh, can be denser um so we're getting to a to a density with that do they that we just that won't be sustainable and will basically it will suffocate us so um we need to st start slowing down adding to the to the downs to adding to the do they and and start um putting you know taking more away and um and you can just looking at that graph that I showed earlier that, um, you know, that, that, that um, uh, indicates the, um, how much, um, or shows the trends of how much um, emissions are being produced. And if we follow that trend, if we keep adding and, and only re um, take out so, so little, then um, we basically run out of budget in six years and, um, and we will we'll be suffocated by our duvet. Um, but we have to um, basically change course now and really get to um, net zero within the next six years, reach that new balance in our region um, that our blanket is not too thick and um, you know, get, um, we, we start to get that balance right that we don't add any more downs to our duvet does that make sense that yeah. is the six that is the six years yeah. and because we have been so bad in our region with with um you know adding to so many emissions we need to um we only have basically six years for um to um, to make up for that and uh, we need to really accelerate our action yeah scary stuff isn't it it's 
Yeah, it is, which which kind of, uh, you know, it, it kind of explains why people like XR and Greta Thunberg kind of, you know, get, are spurred into action and then and can, can seem a bit desperate to the, you know, why, um, because they've been, you know, because when you look at the science, it's so glaringly obvious that we you do have a budget and you're not allowed to overspend. But yet, you know, we're very slow in actually changing the way we we act about it, and that's where a lot of people get very frustrated, and uh, that frustration and um, yeah uh, comes out as uh, as activism. So, are there any more questions? I don't know if you can see this. This is just a chart again from that independent commission of crime, just illustrating kind of what you were just talking about. Um, would you like to ping that uh, link in the chat so people can can watch that? Um, and yes, it is. It is quite a scary, <laughs> a scary. Um, report i'm afraid and then um so obviously we've got this issue in Finland with the um the rural nature of the area which doesn't help with uh transport emissions but we've also got um something like 50 percent of the country's um grade whatever um agricultural land in this area as well so are there plans afoot, do you know, to um, sort of work with the agricultural industry to, um, because they, they can help with carbon sink, am I right in saying that? Um, yes, no, absolutely. No, yeah. Um, so when you look at carbon sinks, um, people usually focus on things like, like trees and, you know, growing forests and stopping deforestation, which is right. But actually, another really big carbon sink is, is healthy soil, and um, in industrialized agriculture, as we see it at the moment, is actually not very healthy and doesn't produce healthy soil. That um, and it actually um, declines the ability of soil to take up um, extract carbon. Um, so there is. There are definitely campaigns, and that links back to what Anna said earlier about supporting people who are doing campaigning and education around these um, these things. There are definitely um, uh, people like horticultural, um, you know, campaigners that um, uh, try to raise awareness of this issue. Whether the government has actually um, picked this up, because I mean, it would be regulated on a government level. I'm not sure. I don't know. Don't know whether Anna or Lana know. My guess is probably not. <laughs> I know that locally, actually. Um, so Anne Miller, who is a, a a CCF volunteer, but she's also part of Carbon Neutral Cambridge, um, was responsible for running a workshop um, on agriculture and carbon sinks. Um, in the last, it would have been in the last couple of years and that was run in partnership with one of the local authorities if if not multiple but I, I I'm afraid I can't remember more details than that off the top of my head um but there might be something on that on the carbon neutral Cambridge website I'll um I'll maybe have a look and I don't know if you know more um I was just going to say again that independent commission on climate report does have a big section on agriculture um that's because that's not my speciality that's not the one that I've really dig dug into but I, yeah it does have quite a big section on that so I'd go and check that out. Shall we take James um, question before we have a little break and then um, start kick off our discussion? James. Thanks um, so uh, this one is actually my day job in a way I uh, work for a government nature conservation agency and we are working at the moment on um, the future of uh, the sort of agricultural subsidies that government pays to farmers um, and there is uh, this is one of the key areas uh, obviously there's always a bit of a limit to what government can do and particularly in this region because it's so productive there's that trade-off of um, being able to store carbon in the soil versus uh, the potential food production that you lose if you restore these areas to uh, 
<clears throat> more natural habitats that might start to build up those carbon stores again. But it's certainly something that um, government is working on. But, um, yeah, there'll be a big, um, there's a big new set of subsidy schemes um, that will be starting over the next few years to hopefully encourage um, farmers to improve the way they manage soils and potentially to do some of that um, rewilding to um, increase carbon storage over the long term as well. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for that. So, um, so we we said we would have a little break, um, give everyone a chance to um, maybe grab a glass of water, and then after after the short break, um, if we come back at um, I guess at five past, then we wanted to give you a chance to um, have a bit of a discussion and really dive a bit deeper into the concept of action on all levels. But we'll we'll talk about that. Um, shall we say five past? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So hi, welcome back. Um, so as I hinted earlier, uh, we want to do a little um, discussion, um, put you into breakout rooms and give you uh, a, a chance to um, speak to each other and, um, and discuss some of the things that we've, we've just um, been going through. So we're going to focus on the, the level of climate levels of climate action uh, like Anna has shown earlier in her in her presentation. So this this overview of the different areas of, um, of, of um, carbon emissions and um, on the left the yellow being the things that create carbon emissions and then the things on the right hand side that um, can extract carbon from from the atmosphere and then the action that would um, uh, that supports that on on each level so for example when we look at cycling um, so in travel for example we on a national level, we could introduce um, cycle-friendly policies. So, for example, like the current update to the, to the um, highway code and things like that. On a corporate level, we might be able to provide safe storage um, for, for bikes on, and shower facilities or support people to invest in bikes. And on a community level, we could promote cycling. Um, so like, like Anna does with, with Camp Cycle and, um, and councils, for example, can create, uh, provide free, free cycle training and infrastructure. And on an individual level, we can set our own personal goals to cycle more and, and actively work to, um, to cycle more and, um, and not take, uh, use the car as much. So for your discussions, what um, the questions we would like you to, um, to consider are, what are the areas where you personally would like to reduce your, your carbon emissions? So when you think of these, this, these, um, the areas, the four areas of your carbon um, footprint, what do you think would be, um, what would be most relevant? Um, what, what, have you set yourself any goals, for example, as a New Year's resolution? Are there any, any areas that you would like to focus on? And what would you need to happen on each level of action to support you? So, for example, if you did say you wanted to um, cycle more, what, what do you need on, to happen on, each, on, on the other levels to, to help you make that happen? And where can you see good progress in climate action lately? So how, are you aware of anything that's been happening in your local community or around, um, around the country um, uh, around um, uh, reducing carbon emissions or creating carbon sinks? And where can you see the biggest need for, for climate action currently? So can you see um, from, from your daily lives where are the, the gaps that we need to fill with, with our climate action. So we're going to put you into groups and um, I'm going to copy and paste the questions into the chat so you can take them with you. And, um, and uh, yeah, we're going to pay, put you in, I guess, two breakout rooms and um, 
and Anna and I will will join each if that's okay, Anna, and then we can um, have a bit of a conversation around Ooh. these. Uh, we're going to spend 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and then um, we'll we'll come back and and have a chat about what we found and what the next steps can be from what we discussed. Hi, welcome back. Amber was just say, telling us how she um, persuaded her husband by lead, uh, to, to eat less meat by leading by example. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, uh, similar it was a similar story in our house. My husband was uh, convinced he could never live without um, without meat until, and then we slowly chipped away at it, and he's been basically vegetarian for for two years now because kind of he got so used to not eating it at home that at some point he was like oh actually I can live without meat so yeah um so leading back we were saying Anna that that leads back to what you were saying earlier about um walking the talk and uh inspiring others by what you what, what you do um so Anna's group would would you like to just share a bit of the mean, but were there any main themes that came out of your your group discussion? Oh, Does somebody else want to talk? I don't mind. Um, I think I think the main thing that that we talked about was um, energy use and uh, energy conversa uh, conversation, energy conservation and looking at um, solar panels, that type of thing, insulation. And we, um, we talked about how the, the, whole, um, the whole way that you improve your home's um, energy efficiency really needs to change because um, you can get contractors in or workmen in and they possibly don't really know what, what they're doing or then they might not know the best way to do it. And you don't really know enough about it to check that they know that they know what they're on about. So um, we were talking about maybe a, um, a, a government level bringing in either legislation or guidance that could, could help people to do that. Okay. Yeah, more, um, more training as well of, of, yeah, like a whole sort of national training scheme as well, really. Um. Yeah, to um, um, ensure um, quality. Uh, I mean, mm. yeah. Um, Swati, James, Ambad, would you like to? One of you would like to um, just pick on some of the points that we raised in our group. Uh, so I think we mainly discussed about travel and food. So, uh, yeah, I was more, yeah, I have changed a lot over the past one year. So I used to eat out a lot. So that's what I have cut down a lot on. And I'm cooking more at home and eating meat less. I mean, I haven't cut it down fully, but we are aware of it. So, and another bit was travel, which I am heavily reliant on car, on uh, using the car right now. And I want to move more into cycling. So I ha I'm on the cycle to work scheme right now from my company. So that is something I look forward to going ahead to change. And yeah, I think James and Amber can add their bits. Yeah, I talked a little bit about travel as well, um, particularly uh, shopping. So I'm quite close to uh, a local supermarket, but it's a challenge to do shopping for a family of four by bicycle. So thinking about a trailer potentially in the future, or maybe a cargo bike, and also a little bit about um, home energy. So just in the process of hopefully moving house and uh, the house we're moving to needs the boiler replacing. So thinking about what we might be able to replace it with Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, and, um, and and I think one thing that I picked up on um, in, in our group was also the um, not 
that people didn't feel safe to cycle. Um, so a lot of people felt that um, the infrastructure and the way that, you know, again, coming also back to, I guess, an, an education piece about the way that drivers learn to drive is not very cycle friendly. They don't expect cyclists on the road. They don't, you know, give, give cyclists a space and make them feel safe on on the road so um a lot of issues around um feeling safe uh, either on the road or the the bike not being safe when you when you lock it and um so yeah uh, that that was definitely one of the things that we picked up on that was kind of the bigger picture um and out of your immediate control we, we were also talking a little bit about sort of what <laughs> <laughs> um, Alana, can you? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, we were also talking a bit about walking and cycling to school and ways to kind of help with that and sort of again saying about, you know, how off-putting it was or so kind of found families dropping off their children at school, even outside secondary schools, kind of loads of cars outside the school gate and um, how, yeah, trying to, trying to encourage people to, to switch modes of transport. Yeah, it can feel like a self-fulfilling prophecy, doesn't it? When, you know, once there are so many cars on the road, you feel safer being one of the cars rather than um, outside one of the cars. Um, okay, yeah, so but, I'm then just... also, but then it's also about like teaching, teaching cyclists how to cycle, right? Because it's not only cars. It's like I see that there's a huge issue also with cyclists, right? To behave in, the, in, a, in a good manner to... to so for everyone to work right it's not only 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 cars i think that's quite quite important is there something in in uk schools that ch children are getting uh, teached about the rules and in, in traffic because that's something in germany that's that's done uh, in within the school environment is that something that teached here as well yeah, there is uh, what's called bikeability training in schools, and that's there's okay. three different levels of that, but it's not compulsory. Um, parents sort of okay. have to agree their child to sign up. So I think, yeah, I, I, not not every child will go through that, but um, it is open to all children. Um, yes, that's quite important, right, for, for everyone's safety as well. Yeah. Um, okay, if any, any other um addition before we move on um i just thought we should just say some of the positive things i mean one of the questions yeah. was about positive action we saw so um we we had various different people said different things so one thing was national trust properties that when you go there it seems like they're really doing a lot of work um kind of less packaging and more um local food and things um, we were saying that maybe like with rising energy costs and the y Ukraine crisis as well, maybe that's sort of making people realise how important it is to get off gas and onto renewables. Um, and we're also talking just about some films, Don't Look Up, Kiss the Ground in 2040, that were kind of maybe again just getting that conversation out and about um, and, and local decision makers really starting to get it as well. Great. That's thanks. Thanks for summarizing the positive points as well. That's um, that's 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 really good. Um, and it leads on quite nicely to uh, what's next. So now that we've had a look at the different levels of action and we um, thought a bit more about um, what needs to happen, um, what so so what next? Now that uh, we've got an idea of what we need to change in our life and and we are quite aware of what needs to change in in our communities around us um so i just wanted to share some of the things that um alumni from our previous installment of um net zero now um so, so the um, this sort of training course that was delivered last year in South Cambridgeshire, uh, what they went on to do after um, running through a bit of training around community action. 
and um, things that they decided to do were um, not only um, creating new eco groups and, and, and networks in their local villages, they also um, a couple of their parishes um, declared climate emergencies, so really ingraining it in their local um, level of government um, that they wanted to take action on climate. Um, very tangible things like vegetarian cookbooks and vegan feasts and um, supporting local people to um, walk and cycle by creating creating maps and, and showing them what the best cycleways and, um, and shortcuts were in the local area. Um, creating sinks, like we said earlier, um, planting trees and, um, and wildflowers, and, um, and also looking at the trees that are already there, um, which ones needed a bit more help or maybe needed some, some new planting some workshops around wildlife friendly gardening and home energy and waste reduction, community fridge, um, book clothes swap. So these are really things that can um, not only um, educate people, but also bring the community together and, and really show that positive action that Alana mentioned earlier, that carbon, uh, Cambridge Carbon Footprint really focuses on this, like that community engagement and showing people the positive ways that um, the, that, that climate action can, can work. And, um, and yeah, so there were a, a lot of the actions that people took away and, and got started in their local communities. So what I would like to invite you to do is um, come along to um, our next sessions. Um, so next week we're going to focus on getting started. So now that we've got all of these ideas or things that we want to do, how do we actually go about um, implementing them and, and getting them started in our local communities? And then the two sessions after that focus in a bit more detail around um, aspects like managing our team and our volunteers so working together. And, um, and the last one is then more around um, outward. So how do we talk to people about climate change? How um, is um, the way XR do it really the best way? Or should we, you know, in our local communities um, do it differently? What are the do's and don'ts um, when, you, when you speak to your local community around climate action? So you can find all of the, those sessions on, um, on, on our website and I'm going to drop the link into the chat again in a session in, in a second and then um, if you want to find out more about any of the things that we spoke um, about today uh, we have a list of um, a short list of, of further reading resources um, that we encourage you to to have a look at um, of course, our very own Cambridge Climate Change Charter, where you can sign um, up to, to take uh, pledge action. And, um, and it's also a good one to share with, with others and start to have a use to start to have a conversation. And, um, and again, I'm going where this is all available on our, our website. And the last thing, or um, almost last thing I wanted to share with you is this, this quote from from one of the participants from last year is, uh, I realized that things can change, but it starts with me. So um, again, looping back to what Anna said earlier about every little helps and, um, and it just needs, you know, one foot in front of the other um, to, to make a difference. And uh, the very last thing, as always, uh, we would really appreciate your feedback. We're going to um, drop a link into the into the chat for you to fill in a really short, I promise, really short um, feedback form. So that would be really great if you could um, take five minutes now to to fill that in. And um, then. Thank you very much, especially thank you for, for to thanks to Anna, um, our guest speaker, to come and join us today and um, and share her her insights. That was really really great. And thanks everyone for for your time. Thank you. It's been really interesting. Yeah, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Thank you.